will call the meeting to order the Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics to a larger extent, our International Grand Committee. We'd like to welcome especially the visitors from around the globe uh, tonight. Uh, if you notice some empty seats beside you, we've uh, heard of some unexpected flight delays for some of the delegations, so they will definitely be here. Uh, some are arriving as we speak, some are arriving in about an hour from now. So again, um, my apologies for them uh, not being here as planned. But I'd like to go through, first of all, the countries that are going to be represented uh, tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. And then we're going to go around with some brief introductions, very briefly, and uh, get right into your presentation. So we're still expecting some of our witnesses to come as well. Uh, we'll start off with the countries that are represented. Uh, confirmed just today, Canada, of course, the United Kingdom, Singapore, Ireland, Germany, Chile, Estonia, Mexico, Morocco, Ecuador, St. Lucia, and Costa Rica. And I will say we have lost a few just due to some things called elections around the globe that we can't really have a control over. So that's just gotten in the way from some of the other countries being able to get here. I see some of our witnesses. Come on up, Mr. Balsilli. Uh, Mr. McNamee as well. Please take your seat at the front. We're just getting started. So uh, welcome. So I want to go around the table quickly as the delegates just to say your name and introduce which country you're from. So go ahead. Let's start off with our member from Estonia. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kate pentus Rasimonus, uh, representing Estonian Parliament today. Hi, everyone. I'm Sun Shilling. Uh, I'm the Senior Parliamentary Secretary of Ministry of Home Affairs and National Development from Singapore. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm a s s Member of Parliament from Singapore and also a Senior Minister of State in the Ministries of Health and Law in Singapore. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jens Zimmermann. I'm a member of the German Bundestag and I'm the spokesperson on digitalization for the Social Democrats. Charlie Angus, Vice Chair of this committee, a uh, member of the New Democratic Party. I represent the constituency of Timmins James Bay, which isn't a country, but it is larger than France. <laughs> <laughs> Jacques Gourde, Deputy Conservateur de Ville Yes. Jacques Gourde, MP. Member of Parliament for Thornhill uh, on the uh, northern city limits of the city of uh, Toronto. I am the critic for the official opposition, the Conservative Party, for on the Ethics Committee, which is responsible for ethics, lobbying, uh, information, and privacy. Smith. So I'm Nate Erskine Smith. I'm a Liberal member representing <coughs> a Toronto area riding called Beaches East York, and I'm uh, the Liberal Vice Chair of this committee. My name is Rarsini. I'm the Member of Parliament for Kitchener Centre, um, and I'm the Liberal Member, and I'm also, uh, I sit on the Foreign Affairs and International Development Committee also. Anita Vanderbilt, I'm Liberal Member of Parliament for Ottawa West Nepean, which is about 15 minutes west of here, and uh, I'm also on the Foreign Affairs Committee and Chair of the Subcommittee on International Human Rights. My name is David Graham. I've got the writing of Laurent Stabel, which is a, a much smaller writing than Charlie's, but much bigger than Singapore. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm on four other committees. This one, I'm not a regular member, but I'm a regular member, if you can call it that. So thank you for this. Thank you. And I'll just finish. Bob Zimmer, Member of Parliament for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies, the beautiful Northern British Columbia riding with the Rockies running right through them. I also chair the Ethics, uh, the Access Information, Privacy and Ethics Committee that we sit before tonight. And also, uh, I'll give Mr. Kent some credit today. I gave you some credit earlier. Uh, this whole idea of the International Grand Committee came out of a... Uh, a Washington summit meeting in a pub uh, with Mr. Erskine Smith, myself, Ian Lucas, and Damian Collins, and that's how it really started. And it, uh, we wanted to do something better. We thought better together as a, a coalition of countries to work out some solutions to these problems. So I'll give you some credit for probably buying one of the beers that one night. So I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to get in. Mr. Angus has had a comment, then we'll get into the presentations. Yeah, Mr. sorry Angus. to interrupt, uh, Chair. I just wanted to uh, confirm um, our committee through all party consensus issued a subpoena to Mr. Zuckerberg and Ms. Sandberg. Um, I do believe that that's unprecedented. I am reading reports that Facebook is speaking to, to media saying they're not showing up to our committee. I am not aware whether they have officially responded to a subpoena. Can you inform this committee whether they have bothered yeah. to respond to us on this issue? Yeah, I've, I've seen similar uh, story I believe was on CNN this afternoon. I have not received that as chair of the committee whether they will, will show up or won't show up. Uh, we've asked the clerk as well. We haven't received any communication to say they're not going to be appearing tomorrow morning. My expectation is, is that we'll have some spaces for them to come and sit and give testimony. 
And if they choose to fill those or not, that's up to them. Again, it's my hope and expectation that they follow through with our subpoena and and uh, show up tomorrow. So uh, that's just my comment back officially. Nothing as chair, nothing as clerk of the committee. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll get right into it tonight. And it's a bit more of an informal presentation from, from our guests tonight, so we won't be asking questions. This is just... I'd say setting the stage for the next couple of days, it's warming up the conversation to what and why we're here. Why do we need to be concerned about big data, privacy, uh, and disinformation, et cetera? So we'll start off, first of all, with uh, Mr. Kent. We'll give you the floor, and uh, I'll give the list so you're prepared to know when you're speaking next. So we're going to go Jason Kent. Uh, maybe I'll just say who, uh, who you're with. Uh, J Jason Kent is rep representing himself as individuals. Jim Balsilli, Chair, Center for International Governance and Innovation. Mr. Roger McNamee, author of Zucked. And uh, I know your resume goes a lot longer than that, so we'll keep it short. Taylor Owen, Associate Professor of McGill University. Uh, ben Scott, Heidi Twarek, Assistant Professor, University of British Columbia. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff, and I've uh, really appreciated your book. I actually read through that guy, so it's uh, very uh, informative. And last but not least, Maria Reza. Uh, she is with us via teleconference, and we're glad you could come with us tonight. I know you've been in some trying circumstances of late, and it uh, would have been nice to have you here, but I understand that's out of your control. So we'll start off with Jason, and next to Jim. Go ahead, Jason. Am I on? They're on mic. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the International Grand Committee. I am the CEO of U.S.-based trade association Digital Content Next and appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of high-quality digital publishers. We represent about 80 publishers globally. Uh, many of them have offices in your home countries. They include the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, uh, BBC, The Guardian, Axel Springer, um, nearly 80 members. To be clear, our members do not include any social media, search engine, or ad tech companies. That may be a part of why I'm here. Uh, DCN has prioritized shining a light on issues that erode trust in the digital marketplace, including a troubling data ecosystem that has developed with very few legitimate constraints on the collection and use of data about consumers. As a result, personal data is now valued more highly than context, consumer expectations, copyright, and even facts themselves. As policymakers around the world scrutinize these practices, we urge you, along with industry stakeholders, to take action. We believe it is vital that policymakers begin to connect the dots between the three topics of your inquiry, data privacy, platform dominance, and societal impact. Today, personal data is frequently collected by unknown third parties without consumer knowledge or control. That data is then used to target consumers across the web as cheaply as possible. This dynamic creates incentives for bad actors, particularly on unmanaged platforms like social media, which rely on user-generated content mostly with no liability, where the site owners are paid on the click, whether it is from an actual person or a bot, on trusted information or on disinformation. We are optimistic about regulations like the GDPR in the EU, which properly enforced, it's important, properly enforced, contain narrow purpose limitations to ensure companies do not use data for secondary uses. We recommend exploring whether large tech platforms that are able to collect data across millions of devices, millions of websites, devices, and apps should even be allowed to use this data for secondary purposes. As an example of critically important action, we applaud the decision of the German cartel office to limit Facebook's ability to collect and use data across its apps and across the web. It's a very important decision. The opaque data-driven ecosystem has strongly benefited intermediaries, primarily Google, and harmed publishers and advertisers. These intermediaries have unique leverage as gatekeepers and miners of our personal data. As a result, issues have surfaced, including bot fraud, malware, ad blockers, clickbait, privacy violations, and now disinformation all over the past decade. However, importantly, these are all symptoms. Make no mistake, the root cause is under unbridled data collection at the most personal level imagined. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's important to understand the power of these two companies. Four years ago, DCN did the original financial analysis labeling Google and Facebook the duopoly of digital advertising. The numbers are startling. In a $150 plus billion dollar digital ad market across the North America and the EU, 85 to 90 percent of the incremental growth is going to just these two companies. As we dug deeper, we connected the revenue concentration to the ability of these two companies to collect data in a way that no one else can. This means both companies know much of your browsing history and your location history. Data is the source of their power. The emergence of this duopoly has created a misalignment between those who create the content and those who profit from it. Finally, these data practice coupled with the dominance without accountability of these two companies is indeed impacting society. The scandal involving Facebook and Cambridge Analytica underscores the current dysfunctional dynamic. Under the guise of research, GSR collected data on tens of millions of Facebook users. As we know, now know, Facebook did next to nothing to ensure that GSR kept a close hold on our data. This data was ultimately sold to Cambridge Analytica and was used for a completely different purpose to target political ads and messages, including in the 2016 U.S. election. With the power Facebook has over our information ecosystem, our lives, and our democratic systems, it is vital to know whether we can trust the company. Many of its practices prior to reports of the Cambridge Analytica scandal clearly warrant significant distrust. Although there's been a well-documented and exhausting trail of apologies, it's important to note that there's been little or no change in the leadership or governance of the company, of Facebook Inc. In fact, the company has repeatedly refused to have its CEO offer evidence to pressing international governments wanting to ask smart questions, leaving lawmakers with many unanswered questions. Equally troubling, other than verbal promises from Facebook, it's not clear what would prevent this from happening again. We believe there should be a deeper probe, as there's still much to learn about what happened and how much Facebook knew about the scandal before it became public. Facebook should be required to have an independent audit of its user account practices and its decisions to preserve or purge real and fake accounts over the past decade. We urge you to make this request. Wrapping up, it is, critically, it is critical to shed light on these issues to understand what steps must be taken to improve data protection, including providing consumers with greater transparency and choice over their personal data when using practices that go outside of the normal expectations of consumers. Policymakers globally must hold digital platforms accountable for helping to build a healthy marketplace and for restoring consumer trust and restoring competition. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues with you today. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Kent, and you've kept very well under your seven-minute timeline. Just to remind everybody, seven minutes is the time allotted, so good job. Uh, next up, Mr. Balsilli. Uh, th Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will take less than that because I'll be giving formal comments tomorrow to the committee. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members, it's my honor and privilege to testify today to such distinguished public leaders. Data governance is the most important public policy issue of our time. It is cross-cutting with economic, social, and security dimensions. It requires both national policy frameworks and international coordination. In my testimony tomorrow, I will, I will give more description and then I will end with six specific recommendations and I will spend a couple minutes today just speaking of one of the recommendations that I would like to bring forward to the, the group. And that is that you create a new institution for like-minded nations to address digital cooperation and stability. The data-driven economy's effects cannot be contained within national borders. New approaches to international coordination and enforcement are critical as policymakers develop new frameworks to preserve competitive markets and democratic systems that evolved over centuries under profoundly different technological conditions. We have arrived at a new Bretton Woods moment. We need new or reformed rules of the road for digitally mediated global commerce a World Trade Organization 2.0. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, the Financial Stability Board was created to foster global financial cooperation and stability. A similar global institution, say, the Digital Stability Board. 
is needed to deal with the challenges posed by digital transformation. The nine countries on this committee, plus the five other countries attending, totaling 14, could constitute founding members of such an historic plurilateral body, which would undoubtedly grow over time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belsilli. Next up, Roger McNamee and Taylor Owen on deck. Go ahead, Mr. McNamee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. I come here as someone who spent an entire professional lifetime <clears throat> involved in Silicon Valley building the best and brightest companies. And the core thing I want you to understand is that the culture of Silicon Valley has come completely off the rails, that the technology industry today is committed to monopoly, it is con it committed to, as Professor Zuboff will describe, a form of capitalism that would be foreign to any of us who've grown up in the last 50 years. And in my mind, the industry has demonstrated that it is not capable of governing itself and that left to its own devices, it will, as a matter of course, create harms that cannot easily be remedied. And as a consequence, I believe it is imperative that this committee and that nations around the world engage in a new thought process relative to the ways that we're going to control companies in Silicon Valley, especially to look at their uh, business models. And the core issue that I would point to here relative to business models is that they by nature invade privacy and they by nature undermine democracy. And there is no way to stop that without ending the business practices as they exist. I believe the only example that we have seen of a remedy that has a chance of success is the one implemented by Sri Lanka recently when it chose to shut down the platforms in response to a terrorist act. I believe that that is the only way governments are going to gain enough leverage in order to have reasonable conversations. And my remarks tomorrow will go into that in more depth. But I want to thank you for this opportunity. I just want you to understand I will be available to any of you at any time to ha give you the benefit of my 35 years inside Silicon Valley so you understand what it is we're up against. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McNamee. Uh, next up, Taylor Owen on deck, uh, Ben Scott. So go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Co-Chair Zimmer and Collins and committee members, um, thank you for having me. I, I have to say it's a, it's a real honor to be here with you and amongst these, um, these other panelists. Um, I'm particularly heartened, though, because even three years ago, I think a meeting like this would have seemed unnecessary to many in the public, the media, the technology sector, and by governments themselves. Um, but now I would suggest we're in an entirely different policy moment. Um, about which I want to make five observations about this policy space we're in right now. Um, the first point I want to make is that it's pretty clear that self-regulation and even many of the forms of co-regulation that are being discussed have and will continue to prove insufficient for this problem. Um, the financial incentives are simply powerfully aligned against meaningful reform. Um, these are publicly traded, largely unregulated companies whose shareholders and directors expect growth by maximizing a revenue model that is itself part of the problem. This growth may or may not be aligned with the public interest. Second point I want to make is this problem is not one of bad actors, but one of structure. Disinformation, hate speech, election interference, privacy breaches, mental health issues, and anti-competitive behavior must be treated as symptoms of the problem, not its cause. Public policy should therefore focus on the design and the incentives embedded in the design of the platforms themselves. It is the design of the attention economy which incentivizes virality and engagement over reliable information. It is the design of the financial model of surveillance capitalism, as we'll hear much more about, which incentivizes data accumulation and its use to influence our behavior. It is the design of group messaging, which allows for harmful speech, even the incitement of violence to spread without scrutiny. It is content, it, it, is, it is a design of, for global scale that is incentivized imperfect automation solutions to content filtering, moderation, and fact checking. And is the design of our unregulated digital economy that has allowed our public sphere to become monopolized. If democratic governments determine that this structure and this design is leading to negative social and economic outcomes, as I would argue it is, then it is their responsibility to govern. 
So the third point I would make is that governments that are taking this problem seriously, many of which are included here, are all converge, converging, I think, on a markedly similar platform governance agenda. This agenda recognizes that there are no silver bullets to this broad set of problems we're talking about, and that instead policies must be domestically implemented and internationally coordinated across three categories, I think. Um, content policies, which seek to address a wide range of both supply and demand issues about the nature, amplification, and legality of content in our digital public sphere. Data policies, which ensure that public data is used for the public good, and that citizens have far greater rights over the use, mobility, and monetization of their data. And competition policies, which promote free and competitive markets in the digital economy. So that's the platform governance agenda. The, the fourth point I want to make is that the propensity when discussing this agenda to overcomplicate solutions serves the interests of the status quo. There are actually many, I think, sensible policies that could and should be implemented immediately. The online ad micro-targeting market could be made radically more transparent, in many cases suspended entirely. Data privacy regimes could be updated to provide far greater rights to individuals and greater oversight and regulatory power to punish abuses. Tax policy can be modernized to better reflect the consumption of digital goods and to crack down on tax base erosion and profit sharing. Modernized competition policy can be used to restrict and roll back acquisitions and to separate platform ownership from application and product development. Civic media can be supported as a public good, and large-scale and long-term civic literacy and critical thinking efforts can be funded at scale by national governments, not by private organizations. That few of these have been implemented is a problem of political will, not of policy or technical complexity. Finally, though, and the four fifth point I want to make is that there are policy questions for which there are neither easy solutions, meaningful consensus, nor appropriate existing international institutions. And where there may be irreconcilable tensions between the design of the platforms and the objectives of public policy. The first is how we regulate harmful speech in the digital public sphere. At the moment, we've largely outsourced the application of national laws, as well as the interpretation of difficult trade-offs between free speech and personal and public harms to the platforms themselves. Companies who seek solutions, rightly in their perspective, that can be implemented at scale globally. In this case, I would argue what is possible technically and financially for the companies might be insufficient for the goals of the public good or the public policy goals. The second is who's liable for content online. We've clearly moved beyond the notion of platform neutrality and absolute safe harbor. But what legal mechanisms are best suited to holding platforms, their design, and those that run them accountable? And finally, as artificial intelligence increasingly shapes the character and economy of our digital public sphere, how are we going to bring these opaque systems into our laws and norms and regulations? These difficult conversations, as opposed to the to the, what I think are, are, are the easier policies that can be implemented, should not be outsourced, in my view, to the private sector. They need to be led by democratically accountable governments and their citizens. But this is going to require political will and policy leadership, um, precisely what I think this committee represents. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Owen. Uh, we'll go next up to Mr. Scott. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here in front of this uh, assembled international committee. I appear before you this evening as an unlikely witness. I say that because I spent pretty much my entire career promoting the virtues of the open internet. I came of age during the internet revolution of the late 90s. I worked on the first truly digital political campaign for President Barack Obama in 2008. I was one of Hillary Clinton's digital diplomats in the heyday of internet freedom during the Arab Spring. It was a moment in time when it seemed like smartphones and social media were the genuine catalyst of social and political movements to democratize the world. It was an inspiring moment. These technologies did help those things happen. I'm an idealist at heart. I wanted to be in the middle of that revolution. But I sit before you today as a troubled idealist. Because I 
Went back and worked for my old boss in 2016 on her presidential campaign. I ran the Technology Policy Advisory Committee. I had a ringside seat to what happened in America between 2015 and 2017. And what I saw was the open internet that was meant to expand freedom instead turned into a powerful technology of social manipulation and political distortion. You all know the story. What was once the great hope for the revitalization of democracy is now considered by many to be among its greatest threats. My friends, that is a bitter irony. Bitter. It doesn't need to be that way. The promise of information networks to distribute power to the people is a promise that we can reclaim. But we need to see at what point did the astonishing control over wealth and power in, the, in this industry begin to develop and steer things off course? And, you know, the roots of this are deep and we can track it back for decades, but I pinpoint a moment in time between 2014 and 2017 when machine learning technologies were applied to social media platforms, so-called artificial intelligence. These technologies were not core to the Facebook and Google business models in 2011 and 2012 during the heyday of the Arab Spring. They arrived on the scene sometime later. And if you want to know when exactly they arrived on the scene, look at the profit and revenue charts of Google and Facebook. I've written down the numbers for Facebook just to give you the case in point. In 2011, Facebook for the first time made a billion dollars in profit on four billion dollars in revenue. In 2017, just six years later, after the advent of these new technologies, they made $16 billion in profit on $40 billion in revenue. That's more than a 10x increase in six years. How did that happen? It happened because they figured out a business model for super profits. Step one, track everything that billions of people do online and put it in a database. Number two, sort that data and group people into target audiences and then sell access to their attention, engineering your entire information marketplace to optimize not for the quality of information or the civility of the dialogue in our society, but optimize just for addictiveness and time spent on the platform. Because the more time people spend on the platform, the more ads they see and the more money they make. It's a beautiful business model and it works. It works. 10x profit in six years. Very few companies can claim anything like that kind of growth. And it's not just the ads that get targeted. Everything gets targeted. The entire communications environment in which we live is now tailored by machine intelligence to hold our attention. This is not a recipe for truth and justice. What feels true performs better than what is true. Conspiracy and hate have become the organizing themes of social media, and that is a space that is easily exploited by propagandists, peddling bigotry, social division, and hatred to the disillusioned. This is the connection between the data markets that we've heard talked about at this table and the abhorrent content that you see online. Whether we're talking about everyday hate speech or we're talking about something truly awful like the shootings in New Zealand. It is the algorithms that lead us into the temptation of our biases. And this is what we have to address. Y tenemos que enfrentarnos a esto. No podemos basarnos en la industria para arreglar este problema. El, el uh, problema sin, el principal está al fondo de las cosas. O sea, estamos hablando del sistema capitalista. O sea. Testimony. Translation, are we good to go? Okay. That's right. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Scott, sorry. Well, I spent the last two and a half years studying this problem pretty much from the day I woke up after the U.S. presidential election in November 2016. And I'm convinced of the thesis that I've just laid out to you. But I want to be clear. Technology doesn't cause this problem. It accelerates it. It shapes it. It shapes its growth and its direction. It determines in which, in which ways social development and history flows. Technology is an amplifier of the intentions of those that use it. 
These consequences are, in my view, not inevitable. There's no technological determinism here. We can, we can fix this, just as we made policy decisions to expand access to affordable internet and to make net neutrality the law of so many lands. We did that to support the democratizing potential of the technology. We can now make policies to limit the exploitation of these tools by malignant actors and by companies that place profits over the public interest. We have to view our technology problem through the lens of the social problems that we're experiencing. And this is why the problem of political fragmentation or hate speech or tribalism in digital media, depending on how you want to describe it, it's why it looks different in each of your countries. It looks different in each of your countries because it feeds on the social unrest, the cultural conflict, and the illiberalism that is native to each society. There are common features that stretch across the board, but each country is going to see this in a slightly different way. And to be fair, our democracies are failing a lot of people. People are upset for good reason, but that upset is not manifesting as reform anymore. It's manifesting as a kind of festering anger. That radicalism comes from the way in technology is shifting our information environments and shaping how we understand the world. We rarely see the world through the eyes of others. We are divided into tribes, and we are shown a version of the world day in and day out, month after month, that deepens our prejudices and widens the gaps between our communities. That's how we have to understand this problem. To treat this, this sickness, this disease, we have to see it holistically. We have to see how social media companies are a part of a system. They don't stand alone as the supervillains, much as we might like to brand them that way, although they carry a great deal of responsibility. But look and see how the entire media market has bent itself to the performance metrics of Google and Facebook. See how television and radio and print have tortured their content production and distribution strategies to get likes, shares, and, and to appear higher in the Google News search results. It's extraordinary. It reinforces itself, the traditional media and the new media. So yes, I, I completely agree with Professor Owen. We need a public policy agenda, and it has to be comprehensive. We need to put red lines around illegal content. We need to limit data collection and exploitation. We need to modernize competition policy to reduce the power of monopolies. We also need to pull back the curtain on this puppet show and show people how to help themselves and how to stop being exploited. I think there's a public education component to this that political leaders have a responsibility to carry. And we need to invest in education. And we need to make commitments to public service journalism so that we can provide alternatives for people. Alternatives to the mindless stream of clickbait to which we have become accustomed. The temptations into which we are led as passive consumers of social media. Now I know this sounds like a lot. But I invite you to join me in recommitting yourself to idealism. It isn't too much to ask because it's what democracy requires. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, next up, uh, Heidi Twarik and on deck, M uh, Ms. Zoboff. So go ahead, Ms. Twarik. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the distinguished members of the International Grand Committee for the kind invitation to speak before you today. It's really an honour to support international cooperation in this form. So in my work, I wear two hats. I'm a historian and I analyse policy. Now, I know wearing two hats is a bit of a strange fashion choice, but in fact, I think it can help to lead us to much more robust solutions that can stand the test of time. So in my policy work, I've written about hate speech and disinformation in Canada, the United States, and in Europe. I'm a member of the steering committee of the Transatlantic High-Level Working Group on Content Moderation Online and Freedom of Expression. Wearing my history hat, I've been working for nearly a decade on the history of media, and I just finished uh, this book, which is called News from Germany, The Competition and Control World Communications, 1900 to 1945. And amongst other things in this book, I detail how it is that Germany's vibrant interwar media democracy descended into an authoritarian Nazi regime that could spread anti-Semitic, racist, and homophobic propaganda around the world. While I was writing this book, the present caught up with history in all sorts of frankly disturbing ways. The far right around the world revived Nazi terminology using Lügenpresse, lying press, 
or Systempresse, system press, to decry the media. Marginalised groups were targeted online, they were blamed for societal ills that they did not cause. News was falsified for political and economic purposes. Like with radio in the first half of the 20th century, a technology designed with utopian aims became a tool for dictators and demagogues. Now, some aspects of the internet, as our other witnesses have described, they are unprecedented. The micro-targeting, the scale, the machine learning, the granular level of surveillance. But some of the underlying patterns look surprisingly familiar to the historians among us. So what I'm going to do then is just offer five brief lessons from this history that I think can guide our policy discussions in the future and enable us to build robust solutions that can make our democracies stronger rather than weaker. The first lesson is that disinformation is also an international relations problem. Information warfare has been a feature, not a bug, of the international system for at least a century. So the question is not, if information warfare exists, but why and when states engage in it. And what we see is that it's often when a state feels encircled, weak, or aspires to become a greater power than it already is. This is as true for Germany 100 years ago as it is for Russia today. So if many of the causes of disinformation are geopolitical, we need to remember that many of the solutions will be geopolitical and diplomatic as well. Second, we need to pay attention to the physical infrastructure of what is happening. Information warfare disinformation is also enabled by physical infrastructure, whether submarine cables a century ago or fibre optic cables today. One of Britain's first acts of war in World War I was to cut the cables that connected Germany to the rest of the world, pushing Germany to invest in a new communications technology, radio, that by the time the Nazis came to power, one American radio executive would call the most potent political agency the world had ever known. Now, we often think of the internet as wireless, but that's fundamentally untrue. 95 to 99% of international data flows through undersea fiber optic cables. Google partly owns 8.5% of those submarine <coughs> cables. Content providers also own physical infrastructure. Now, sometimes those cables get disrupted because they get bitten through by sharks, uh, but states can bite too. And we do know that Russia and China, for example, are surveying European and North American cables. China, we know, is, of course, <coughs> investing in 5G, but combining that in ways that Germany did as well with investments in international news networks like the Belt and Road News Network, English-language TV channels like CGTN, um, or the Chinese news agency Xinhua. Third, as many of the other witnesses have said, we need to think about business models much more than individual pieces of content. It's very tempting to focus on examples of individual content that's particularly harmful. But the reason that those pieces of content go viral is because of the few companies that control the bottleneck of information. Only 29% of Americans or Brits understand that their Facebook newsfeed is algorithmically organized. The most aware are the Finns, and there only 39% of them understand that. That invisibility accords social media platforms an enormous amount of power. That power is not neutral. At a very minimum, we need far more transparency about how algorithms work, whether they are discriminatory, and so on and so forth. Because as we strive towards evidence-based policy, we need good evidence. Fourth, we need to be careful to design robust regulatory institutions. And here, the case of Germany in the interwar period offers a cautionary tale. Spoken radio emerged in the 1920s, Bureaucrats in the Democratic Weimar Republic wanted to ensure that radio would bolster democracy in a very, very new democracy after World War I. As that democracy became more and more politically unstable, those bureaucrats continually instituted reforms that created more and more state supervision of content. And the idea here was to protect democracy by preventing news from spreading that would provoke violence. The deep irony of this story is that the minute the Nazis came to power, they controlled radio. So well-intentioned regulation, if we're not careful, can have tragic, unintended consequences. So what does that mean for today? It means we have to democracy-proof whatever the solutions are that we come up with.
We need to make sure that we embed civil society in whatever institutions we create. So one suggestion that I've made uh, with Fenwick McKelvey and Chris Tanove is the idea of social media councils that we would be multi-stakeholder fora and that could meet regularly to actually deal with many of the problems that we're describing. The exact format, geographical scope, they're still up for debate, uh, but it's an idea supported by many, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion. Fifth, we need to make sure that we still pay attention to and address the societal divisions exploited by social media. The seeds of authoritarianism need fertile soil to grow. And if we do not attend to the underlying economic and social discontents, better communications cannot cannot obscure those problems forever. So let me then remind you of these five lessons. First, disinformation is also an international relations problem. Second, we need to pay attention to physical infrastructure. Third, business models matter more than individual pieces of content. Fourth, we need to build robust regulatory institutions. And fifth, we must pay attention to those societal <coughs> divisions that are exploited on social media. In attending to all of these things, there is no way it can be done within any one nation. It must be done also through international cooperation. That's why it's such a great honour to have had the chance to appear before you today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Twark. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Zuboff. And with the name with Zimmer, we've always been at the end of every list, so uh, you're just about there. So anyway, go ahead, Ms. Zuboff. Good to have you here. Thank you so much, Chairman Zimmer. Yes, indeed, I'm reminded of elementary school <laughs> tonight. But of course, you reverse the order tomorrow morning. Is that right? <laughs> Just because I understand. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> a life, a lifelong burden. <laughs> it, it's such an honor to be speaking with you here tonight. Uh, not in least in part because um, I feel that this commission right now is our information civilization's best hope for making progress against the threats to democracy that are now endemic as a result of uh, what you've already heard referred to as surveillance capitalism. And I'm, I'm so pleased to hear the kind of um, synergy already in our comments because uh, I wanted to begin also by saying that the themes that the Commission has identified uh, to target, the themes of platform accountability, of uh, data security and privacy, and of um, fake news and, and misinformation, that these are all effects, and they are effects of one shared cause. And, and I think we've heard that, that theme tonight, and that's, that's just such a big step forward. So it's very, I think it's very important to underscore that. Um, I identify this underlying cause as surveillance capitalism. And I define surveillance capitalism as a comprehensive systemic economic logic that is unprecedented uh, in our experience. Um, I want to take a moment to say what surveillance capitalism is not, because I think that sets up a set of distinctions that we all need to hear. First of all, and it has been mentioned, thank you, Ben, surveillance capitalism is not technology. It has hijacked the digital for its own purposes. Uh, it is easy to imagine the digital without surveillance capitalism. It is impossible to imagine surveillance capitalism without the digital. Conflating those is a dangerous category error. Number two, surveillance capitalism is not a corporation, nor is it a group of corporations. There was a time when surveillance capitalism was Google. And then, thanks to Sheryl Sandberg, who I call the typhoid Mary of surveillance capitalism, surveillance capitalism could have been called Google and Facebook. Ultimately, it became the default model for Silicon Valley and the tech sector. 
But by now, this is a virus that has infected every economic sector. And that is why you began with, with such a, a, a startling and important claim, which is that personal data is valued more than content. Uh, the reason is that all of these activities, whether we're talking about insurance, retail, publishing, finance, uh, all the way through to uh, product and, and service, uh, manufacturing and, um, and administration, all of these sectors are now infected with surveillance capitalism, so much so that we hear the CEO of the Ford Motor Company, the birthplace of managerial capitalism a century ago, now saying that the only way for Ford to compete with the kind of PEs and market cap that companies like Facebook and Google have is to reconceptualize the company as a data company and stream the data for, from the 100 million drivers of Ford vehicles. And those data streams now will put them on a par uh, with the likes of Google and Facebook. Who would not want to invest in us, he says. So we can no longer confine surveillance capitalism to a group of corporations or a sector. Finally, surveillance capitalism cannot be reduced to a person or a group of persons. As attractive as it is to identify it with some of the leaders of the leading surveillance capitalists or the duopoly, the Zuckerbergs, the Pages, the Brins, and so forth, uh, we have blown past that point in our history when we can make that kind of identification. As an economic logic, which is structured and institutionalized, change the characters. There may be good independent reasons for changing the characters, limiting their roles, limiting their extraordinary and unprecedented power. But that will not interrupt or outlaw surveillance capitalism. All right, so having said what it is not, let us just say very briefly what it is. Surveillance capitalism follows the history of market capitalism in the following way. It takes something that exists outside the marketplace and it brings it into the market dynamic for production and sale. Industrial capitalism famously claimed nature for the market dynamic to be reborn as land or real estate which could be sold or purchased. Surveillance capitalism does the same thing but now with a dark and startling turn. What it does is it claims private human experience for the market dynamic. Private human experience is repurposed as free raw material. These raw material are rendered as behavioral data. Some of these behavioral data are certainly fed back into product and service improvement, but the rest are declared a behavioral surplus, identified for their rich predictive value. These behavioral surplus flows are then channeled into the new means of production, what we call machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. From there, what comes out of this new means of production? A new kind of product, prediction products. What these factories produce are predictions of human behavior. You all may recall a 2018 Facebook memo that was leaked. We still don't know exactly by whom. That Facebook memo gave us um, insight into this hub, this machine intelligence hub of Facebook, FB Learner Flow. And what we learned there is that trillions of data points are being computed in this new means of production on a daily basis. Six million, quote, predictions of human behavior, unquote, are being fabricated every second in FB learner flow. Now, what this alerts us to is that surveillance capitalists own and control not one text, but two. There is the public-facing text. When we talk about data ownership, data accessibility, data portability, we're talking about the public-facing text, which is derived from the data that we have provided 
to these entities through our inputs, through our innocent conversation, what we have given to the screen. But what comes out of these means of production, the prediction products and how they are analyzed, that is a proprietary text, not a public-facing text. I call it the shadow text. And the all of the market capitalization, all of the revenue, the incredible riches that these companies have amassed in a very short period of time, all derive from the shadow tax. These proprietary data will never be known to us. We will never own that data, we will never have access to that data, and we will never port that data. That is what is the source of all of their money and power. Now, what happens to these prediction products? They are sold into a new kind of marketplace that trades exclusively in human futures. The first name of this marketplace was called online targeted advertising. And the human predictions that were sold in those markets were called click-through rates. Zoom out only a tiny bit. And what you understand is that the click-through rate is simply a fragment of a prediction of a human future. By now, we understand that these markets, while they began in the context of online targeted advertising, are no more confined to that kind of marketplace than mass production was confined to the, to the fabrication of the Model T. Mass production was applied to anything and everything successfully. And this new logic of surveillance capitalism is following the same route. It is being applied to anything and everything successfully. Now, finally, when we look at these human futures markets, how do they compete? They compete on the quality of their predictions. What I have understood in studying these markets is that by reverse engineering these competitive dynamics, we unearth the economic imperatives that drive this logic. These economic imperatives are institutionalized in significant ecosystems that thread through our economy from suppliers uh, of behavioral surplus to suppliers of computational capabilities and analysis to market makers and market players. <clears throat> These imperatives are compulsions from these imperatives, every headline that we, that we open the paper every day and we see a fresh atrocity, every single headline can be predicted by these imperatives. It began with economies of scale. We need a lot of data to make great predictions. It moved on to economies of scope. We need varieties of data to make great predictions. And now it has moved into a third phase of competition, economies of action, where the most predictive forms of data come from actually intervening in human behavior, shaping, tuning, herding, coaxing, modifying human behavior in the directions of the guaranteed outcomes that fulfill the needs of surveillance capitalism's business customers. This is the world that we now live in. As a result, surveillance capitalism is an assault on democracy from below and from above. From below, its systems, globally institutionalized systems of behavioral modification mediated by global digital architectures are a direct assault on human autonomy, on individual sovereignty, the very elements without which the possibility of a democratic society is unimaginable. From above, what surveillance capitalism means is now, we now enter the third decade of the 21st century. After all the dreams that we held for this technology that Ben has described to us, 
we enter this third decade marked by an asymmetry of knowledge and the power that accrues to that knowledge that can only be compared to the pre-Gutenberg era, an absolutist era of knowledge for the few and ignorance for the many. They know everything about us. We know almost nothing about them. They know everything about us, but their knowledge about us is not used <coughs> for us, but rather for the purposes of their business customers and their revenues. To complete, it is auspicious that we are meeting tonight in this beautiful country, <coughs> Canada, because right now, the front line of this war between surveillance capitalism and democracy is being waged in Canada, specifically in the city of Toronto. <laughs> because surveillance capitalism began with your online browsing, moved to everything that you do in the real world through Facebook's online, quote, massive scale contagion experiments, and Google incubated Pokemon Go. It experimented with population level herding, tuning, and behavior modification. Those skills, by the way, are now being, have now been integrated into Google's smart city application called Waze. But the real apple here, the real prize, is the smart city itself. This is where surveillance capitalism wants to prove that it can substitute computational rule, which is, after all, a form of absolutist tyranny, computational rule for the messiness and beauty of municipal governance and democratic contest. The frontier is the smart city. If it can conquer the smart city, it can conquer democratic society. And right now, the war is being waged in Toronto. If Canada gives Google and Sidewalk Labs now goes out of its way to claim we are not Google, if Canada gives Google slash Alphabet Toronto, a blow will be struck against the future possibilities of a democratic society in the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. And uh, I hope to return to this discussion tomorrow with the rest of the testimony. Thank, Thank you Ms. so much. Zuboff. Thank you, Ms. Zuboff. Uh, lastly, uh, we'll go to Maria Reza. She's all the way from uh, Manila in the Philippines. So go ahead, Ms. Reza. Good morning. Uh, first of all, it, what a privilege to be in front of you and to listen to everyone. I think take everything that you've heard, especially what Soshana just said, and uh, I'm living this stuff right now. So what, what we're doing, I've been a journalist for more than 30 years, and uh, uh, in the last 14 months, I've had 11 cases filed against me by the government. I've had to post bail eight times in a little over three months. Um, I've been arrested twice in five weeks. All of this stuff, uh, bottom up. I call that astroturfing on social media, bottom up information operations that are going down. And then, and then you have top down, again, described for you much more fully earlier. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I'll give you a formal presentation tomorrow. I think in the end, it comes down to everything that you have heard goes down to the battle for truth. And journalists are on the front line of this, along with activists. We're among the first targeted. Uh, the legal cases, the law being weaponized against me came after social media was weaponized. So this battle for truth, no other time do we really know that information is power. If you can make people believe lies, then you can control them. And that's, you know, aside from aside from the commercial aspects of it, we're talking about information as a means to gain geopolitical power. If you have no facts, then you have no truth. If you have no truth, you have no trust. And we've seen that erosion. Um, we first in Rappler uh, were a startup that 
really looked at information cascades, uh, social networks, family and friends, social media, are your family and friends on steroids? So we looked at how information cascaded. What I'll show you tomorrow is the data that shows you exactly how quickly a nation, a democracy can crumble because of information operations. You say a lie a million times, it is the truth. Uh, this phrase, patriotic trolling. Uh, online, state-sponsored hate, targeting an individual or an organization <clears throat> or an activist, pounding them to silence, inciting hate. And we all know that online hate leads to real-world violence. Um, we're the cautionary tale. I've had as much as 90 hate messages per hour. Uh, my nation has moved in three years time from a very vibrant democracy where social media for social good was really used. You know, we lived it. I believed in, uh, we were, my organization was one of the ones that worked very closely with Facebook. Um, and then to see it weaponized the end of 2015 and 2016, it wasn't until after President Duterte took office in July of 2016, the beginning of the drug war, the first targets were anyone on Facebook who questioned the numbers of killings. The UN now estimates more, I'll give you the number that they estimate, 27,000 people killed since July 2016. It's a huge number. Um, I'll just end by saying tomorrow I will give you the data that shows it. It is systematic. It is an erosion of truth. It is an erosion of trust. When you have that, then the voice with the loudest megaphone wins. In our case, it's President Duterte. You see the same things being carried out in the United States, whether it's Trump, Putin, or Duterte, very similar methodology. I'll end with this and just say thank you for bringing us in. I mean, what's so interesting about these types of discussions is that the countries that are most affected are democracies that are most vulnerable like ours here in Southeast Asia, in the global South. Every day that action is not taken by the American tech platforms, the social media platforms, which should have American values, the irony of course is that they've eroded that in our countries. There's some action that's been taken. I will say where we work closely with Facebook as a fact checker and I've seen that they're looking at the impact and they've been trying to move at it. It has to move much faster. And here's the last part of this. If they're, if they're responding to political situations in the West, it normally leads to neutral responses. Neutral responses mean in the global South, people will die, people will get jailed. This is a matter of survival for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reza. That pretty much brings up uh, us to the end of our evening as uh, testimonies. We're going to go to the room just down the hallway in 215A to meet more informally and just uh, be able to ask you questions directly. Sorry, again, Ms. Reza, you're not able to be here. But again, the, the idea tonight was to get the conversation going, and that will continue over there. And I just want to remind everybody, we're going to start crisply at 8.30 tomorrow morning with testimony. So I challenge you to be here uh, when you can. I am going to be much more limited in latitude. I gave some latitude tonight with time. Tomorrow, it's going to be very crisp at five minutes each uh, as questioning uh, folks on the committee. And again, we just look forward to the testimony. Thank you very much for coming. We won't hear some of you again, uh, but we thank you for making the special trip to be part of this panel tonight. And uh, we look forward to this conversation continuing regardless of this uh, Wednesday meetings will end at noon, that the conversation continues on how to make our, our data world a better place. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you just down the hall. Thank you.